Next is Roz Ray. She's going to be leading a exciting discussion about the evolving world of jigsaw puzzles. So good morning, everybody. This session, I hope, will involve all of you or anybody who feels like they want to speak up at, at the right point. Um, so it's not just going to be us uh, speaking at you, but um, we want to uh, hear lots of ideas. Um, this discussion was inspired by the fact that we had the COVID uh, shutdown in 2020. And um, uh, it, I think, from my perspective, changed the puzzle world to a certain extent. It gave some people more time to work on new ideas. It also increased the interest in puzzles. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to get a perspective from different kinds of uh, uh, pe uh, people who have different connections with the puzzling world. So um, today we've got four people up here. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what their connection to puzzles is. And then we're going to uh, have a couple of questions. And from there, I have no idea which way the uh, discussion will go. It will all depend on you and your interests. We want to uh, address the things that you're interested in. So I'm going to ask Janelle to be the first to introduce herself and tell us what is your connection to puzzles, Janelle? Well, thank you, Roz. So, uh, as you guys probably know, I make puzzles, but I'm specifically on the laser cut puzzle side. Hi, I'm Yvonne, and I'm just a puzzle enthusiast. I do lots of puzzles. I also speed puzzle, um, having just come back from the World Championships uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, something like that. Well, tonight was a, uh, last night was a World Championship, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> I guess there are people from all over the world, so I guess you can say that. Yeah. My name is Nick, and I'm curator of table games, including jigsaw puzzles at Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. We are honored to hold over 7,000 of the puzzles owned by, formerly owned by Andy Williams. And I'm Spencer Bean. Uh, my wife and I own the Water for Puzzle Company, formerly Elms Puzzles. So for each of you who are very involved with puzzles on a day-to-day -day basis, what have you seen at this parlay that either surprised you or was something new or uh, opened your eyes to a new way to look at puzzles? Take, take it from there. Anybody? Anybody could start. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, I was not aware of how popular it seems wooden puzzles have become. But I was not aware of that rental is coming back and that subscription service is alive and well, just like in the 1930s, most recently. Uh, for me, the biggest thing, this is my first parlay, and so it's been everything I expected and also nothing that I expected. Um, and so it's been really fun to get to know everybody here and to see the level of passion uh, both from the enthusiast side and from the creator side, uh, that there really is a, a much more um, passionate group of puzzlers than I originally anticipated. Uh, so for me, that's probably been the biggest takeaway. I think the thing that was newest that I saw was the par puzzles with different mediums stuck to it, like the felt and the shed, <laughs> and the, there was canvas for one, and I was very surprised about that, because I thought that that, it, that would be very hard to cut, and then it would fray easily and stuff, but it turned out it was actually fine. <laughs> and it was a very interesting to see that. Nick, remind me what you said. <laughs> I'm really tired. Rental <laughs> subscriptions. Okay, rental like subscriptions. On the note of the rental subscription, a lot, um, 
Anybody that is in the Wooden Jigsaw Puzzle Club Facebook specifically came here because they started, you know, learned about the Puzzle Parlor from that, please stand up. Um, they're probably, a lot of them are probably gone, but like, you know, there's a, a really large influx, especially of younger people that are very active on the Facebook group for the rental club that Artifact runs. And that has been a, you know, a flush of new blood. So that's, that definitely, Facebook. yeah, is anything. Facebook did something good. I, what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that as planners of the Puzzle Parley, uh, in the last couple of years, um, those of us who are uh, on the older side uh, of, the, of the crew here um, have been absolutely blown away by how, f how fast puzzling seems to be spreading through social media and um, people are making connections in ways that, that uh, we never did. 20 years ago, so uh, and and it's brought some some new people to the group, and I think that's been fascinating. And we welcome you, and we're so happy that you decided to come to the the parley this time around. And I hope that you will give us your ideas about what you'd like to see in the future at puzzle parlays, because uh, um, we can't stay in the past. We need to. Uh, to, to move along with the interests that are out there. So, unless anyone on the panel has thought of something else they want to say, either about design or marketing or uh, the, uh, uh, sharing or making puzzles, I would open it up to comments. So, one thing I mentioned to uh, this, our email thread was the one thing that I've really noticed, well, two things actually, that I've noticed as a trend in what puzzles are being made is tessellations because you need a computer program to do that. So um, laser cut tessellations, unless you're Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. So <laughs> he left already. <laughs> but like I as somebody who has two tessellating puzzles now, uh, I notice it when I see it from somebody else. As another maker, um, that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, DIY paint it yourself puzzles. That is like I've got one. Um, there's a company in Germany that did, did like a cuckoo clock that is a paint it yourself type of one. So I'm kind of seeing them pop up. Um, do you know any off the top of your head that you've seen that are painted yourself? Yeah, Limnol has another one that's wood grain that you paint. She also, she also sends markers. Markers with the puzzle too. There's like one puzzle that comes with markers that you can color yourself. Um, yeah. Yes. There, there's a guy in Alaska who uh, cuts puzzles and has a pack of colored pencils that is shrink wrapped to the puzzle. Thank you. Yes. Totally forgot about that. There have been color your own puzzles, cardboard ones, for a while. Um, I just wanted to say, because I have to look at everything from a historical point of view, COVID had something to do with this surge, just like the Great Depression had something to do with the surge in 1930s. And everybody here, even uh, us older folks, Nick, can you realize the microphone the biggest, Sorry, the biggest surge since the 1930s. And it doesn't look like it's stopping from the research I've been able to do. A lot of firms and predictions say that it's still going to go up. Um, the internet is what word of mouth was in the 30s and the teens. That's what I think. Yeah, um, I, I've also been surprised by the proliferation of laser cut companies in general. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense that that laser cut, I think, would, would kind of explode as a result of COVID as people are looking for cheaper and faster and more uh, mass production friendly ways of making these puzzles. Obviously, you didn't see a, a whole ton of hand cut companies crop up during the pandemic, um, but you did see a lot of lasers try to you know test their, test their feet in the waters. 
Um, and so I'm interested to see personally uh, where that goes, where laser goes, because some of the stuff that you're doing with lasers is just mind blowing. Like the anodized puzzles, oh, it is so cool to see what technology is, is doing to the puzzle industry. Uh, and so from someone who uh, wants to lean into the hand cut, hand crafted side of things, I'm just fascinated to see where the technology takes it. It's really cool. My main answer is puzzles and the same thing happened with mechanics and puzzles and that the increase in interest in mechanics and puzzles has overwhelmed the handcrafted uh, uh, makers of puzzles so much so that people who would really like to have them who have been around collecting for many, many years now can't get these puzzles because those people are getting them. So, like Baser has really increased the uh, demand for uh, Puzzle, 3D printing uh, uh, mechanical puzzles has done the same thing in there. So I would say most of the puzzles that are purchased now are mechanical. I'm going to put it on 3D printing. Most of them. So it's almost, almost the same thing. Are there still some handcrafted businesses out there that are thriving in the mechanical world? They're overwhelmed. Of course, they can't take a look at them. Muscle boxes. Muscle boxes. I'd like to ask the the hand cut um, puzzle crafters who are in uh, our audience or part of our, our parley today um, to say a little bit about how COVID affected their business and what their customers, or if there are any differences in the last few years about what their customers are asking of them or looking for from you all as hand cut puzzlers. Anybody have any thoughts? I, I would say, um, you know, as a, as a person who primarily makes hand cut puzzles but has dabbled with working with companies that have license my designs to both laser cut and make cardboard versions of them, I get demand from all, all of those brands. Um, you know, people are wanting things at every price point from me. They want to be able to play my puzzles at the price they want. And it is a little overwhelming right now because my most popular designs that are hand cut, you're like, oh, this sold out in, you know, 20 minutes on Monday morning at 9 o'clock when I usually release my puzzles when I'm not traveling. Like, I've got my customers trained. Visit my website Monday morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> and then if the popular design sells and then people keep asking for more of them, then it's not quite as special. So you've got this sort of catch-22 because you've got a really cool design, but if you make more than five or ten of them, it's not as special to the customer anymore because then your hand-cut puzzle looks more like a manufactured, you know, factory puzzle. So that's where you can sort of be clever in incorporating partnerships with other companies to sort of license your most popular kind of concepts and put them at a medium or lower price point in a different manufacturing strategy. But again, I'm a one-person company, so that's a lot to do. So yes, John's got a really great point about how a lot of hand-cut companies <laughs> have been overwhelmed in the pandemic. And it's great for business, but it's also, and also going back to Aaron's talk, it brings you all these questions like, how do I actually expand and go forward? Even if I'm successful, I, it's just sort of, there's a lot of questions about, you know, which way to move forward and the best way to use your time to satisfy your customer base and to make interesting art and, you know, puzzles in general. Yeah. To add to that, what's happening in a lot of, for a lot of hand cuts, in the mechanic world, is it's gone through the lottery system, where I used to just be able to say, I want one when you get a finished making them. Now I have to uh, get into the lottery and very seldom win it because there are so many people. So when I was growing up, I didn't know anything about wooden puzzles until I, I met the and it was like fascinating. 
So we did the cardboard ones, and we had all kinds, and we'd do it on a Sunday or something, or, you know, the whole family wasn't going here and there. So, but two questions, or one question and then a statement. So, as a child, I played with puzzles. And of course, it was black and white TV, and, um, you know, you had party lines. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, so, this, so I don't know um, the demographics, because y'all here love puzzling and love puzzles. And, but in the end, if you have a business, you want to share that love, but you also want to make the money. Now, I was a registered nurse, and honest to goodness, every day, I loved getting up and going to work. I loved helping people. But I went into nursing for money, only because of the things that happen in life. So, um, you want to make money. So, demographically, you're tr aren't you trying to reach really younger? I mean, there's a lot of young people here, but we're talking <laughs> children. <laughs> so, so that you put that love in there for them. Because, I say this because I am so frustrated by my grandchildren. <laughs> you cannot get them off of. Okay. I won't be expletive. Um, <laughs> They need to do puzzles. <laughs> so, they don't need to do this. two questions then. How would you get that in there? I, I, the, the one lecture about uh, having companies uh, uh, support for uh, the puzzle industry, you know, like the, the, the warden, I, I was just. Right. The, the advertising. The advertising, thank you. So then, so that, that's one question to think about. And the other one is, it just dawned on me, because I, I, I see one grandson, it's just like Minecraft. <laughs> I mean, but building things. So I thought, well, how far-fetched, and I wouldn't know how to even do it, uh, some computer misses here, uh, Mike, that you would make a program that would actually take some way or another show a bunch of puzzles with, I don't know, superheroes, and then they could click and maneuver the pieces around. Do they exist? They exist. There's, there's thousands and thousands. Oh, okay. Of well, I'm done. I'm done. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, on your iPhone, there's on iOS, there are literally thousands of puzzle apps. I've made one, and I got I got demolished by the competition. <laughs> Do you know the demographic you were playing against? I, mine were mine were too difficult. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, it's it's called the Baffler. You can just look for it on iOS, but it's not supported anymore. The developer was a total flake. <laughs> but most of them, yes, you can pick your image, and then it's a pre-cut grid puzzle for the most part, and you, you sort of put your finger on the screen, you slide the puzzle piece around, you can use two fingers to rotate it, and once it gets near the spot where it's supposed to go into your virtual puzzle, it basically makes a little clicking noise and pops into place. Oh, boy. Well, to... to yeah, I was gonna say. Well, to, to your earlier question about how you know how we're getting kind of the younger generations in, I I personally view, uh, and I'm interested in kind of what everyone else's perspective is. I, I sort of view it as a progression from cardboard to laser to handcrafted. Uh, I think that you know cardboard, from a price point and just ease of getting into the market, cardboard is easily the best place to start. And from there, I think people then discover wood and then discover the difference between laser wood and hand cut wood. Uh, and so I tend to rely on the cardboard companies and the laser companies to help build up the funnel uh, for people to eventually move their way into the hand cut. And whether or not we ever experiment with laser cut, I'm not sure to help kind of bridge the gap between cardboard and hand cut. 
Um, but you're absolutely right. It could be, I, I think that it's what Apple did by placing all of their Macs in elementary schools uh, for people like me who now will only use a Mac. <laughs> uh, and if we, can get the, if we can get people started early, and for us, at least on the hand cut side, we tend to find that that's most successful with our established existing customers. It's uh, bringing that into a family tradition setting. And if we can get people puzzling at the holidays, if we can get grandkids in uh, puzzling these really beautiful hand cut puzzle experiences that hopefully will, they are raising that new generation on our behalf. So I have a six year old. There was a question about getting younger people interested in puzzles. Uh, one of the hand, uh, hand, hand crafters and I work with uh, two schools in the Dayton, Ohio area. not being frustrated by them and not saying I can't do this kind of thing. And they actually teach a one semester, one credit class every year in puzzle solving and puzzle. Great, thanks John. You great. can get younger people interested, but it takes effort to get it in front of our them and from them. Nice. I was about to say, I have a six year old. Like I do, but that's okay. Um, he, I do, I do find that he's more apt to play with them if they're out already. Like a friend had came over and wanted to do puzzles, and they're laying out, and he'll go ahead and do like four in a row. Um, so if they're stacked on a bookshelf, he won't go and go get it himself. That's not his choice. His choice is Legos, which is fine because that works too. Um, but also. I think a lot of kids these days aren't bored, and I think that's what helps lead the way to find puzzles and other things to interest you. And the, for, my kid is an only child, so he gets bored because we don't let him watch TV all the time while we're doing stuff. We're like, either you clean your room or you find something to do, <laughs> and then he goes and finds something to do. So, but his choice is usually Lego. So, but that's fine. He can do whatever he wants. <laughs> so, interest. She mentioned interest. Um, gift them puzzles. Buy puzzles from all the makers and give them to them, but make it something that they're actually interested in. Like, if you find a Minecraft puzzle, give them a Minecraft puzzle if you know that that's what that thing is. Ravensburger has a whole line of Minecraft. Like, f tap into their interests because yeah. that also gives you a better connection to your grandkids. So Nick, at the museum, there's a lot of interactives. You have a lot of interactives on the floor of the museum that people can enjoy. Are there puzzles out there for, for kids? What are they looking, what are people looking for at the museum? Uh, things, tactile things, and yes. There have been certainly puzzles on the floor and on tables we can play. There's also uh, a huge Tetris game, which is in a way electronic puzzle. Uh, get puzzles out, Minecraft puzzles, and then say ice cream if you do this puzzle. <laughs> Janelle brought up tessellations, and that makes an interesting puzzle opportunity for kids because right, if you lose pieces, it's okay if they're massively interlocking, right? You, you can, but I also want to say that board games, you know, as an industry, I don't know the relative sizes, but you know, they, they've been growing for decades, and and you know, you, there's a new economy and genre with you know Euro board games that's, that's continuing to expand. It'd be a great tie-in, and that boomed during COVID. And yes. Yeah. So I just want to comment about the getting younger people involved. So <clears throat> I've always loved puzzles. I tried to get my kids interested in puzzles, and they never were really that interested in doing them, except that I, I like to photograph my puzzles. So I have um, 
pastime puzzles. I'll take the figure pieces out and take a picture. And my daughter loved to put the figure pieces back. Um, and then she, later on, when she met her now husband, their family had a tradition of doing jigsaw puzzles at Christmas. So then she really got into doing jigsaw puzzles. Now she has children, and her daughter expressed interest in doing puzzles. She wanted to help me with the puzzles, but she was too young. She's like two and a half years old. So I bought a 12-piece puzzle and brought it over, and she just loved to play with it. And then I would bring it home, and I'd bring it back the next time. So then it became something special that she couldn't do all the time, and she seemed to really enjoy it. I gave it to my grandson and one of my sons, and he really enjoyed it. So maybe just exposing puzzles at an early age might be a way to get them involved or doing it as a family. Uh, a question in the back there. Hi. Come uh, so I got two uh, different questions, not related to children. I wanted to talk about the supply chain. Um, I'm in manufacturing services and I, I do purchase a lot of products for the charity I work uh, with. And um, I wanted to ask, especially uh, people who produce a lot of puzzles here, so from the companies, if you experienced um, and are still experiencing kind of supply chain issues, whether it's with wood or paper, or we had it especially in packaging and plastic, and some stuff comes from other countries, so there were obviously delays with China and so on. Or is it mainly around labor shortages? Because my personal um, experience with puzzles, I ordered a puzzle from Liberty last year as a gift for friends, uh, for it was December. Um, I didn't even get a response until March. And I was wondering why are companies so overwhelmed? How long does it take to, to, to maybe train new cutters? Or is it really that, you, that the companies didn't have materials? Um, to make this, just interesting because everyone talks about um, being overwhelmed. But in businesses, I think we were able generally to respond faster in the take us a year to kind of do that. So I'm wondering, and I'm very interested in the perspective of the companies. Thank you. Spencer. Uh, so we don't do mass production. Uh, we, and we have been relatively unaffected uh, as far as supplies go. Uh, wood, we, uh, as soon as things started to get a little hairy, we stocked up on a little extra wood uh, and are still moving through that supply. Uh, we did have a round of boxes get stuck in Long Beach earlier this year with everything else. Um, but relatively unaffected for us, but I was talking, I don't know if, how many are familiar with Eric Dowdle's art, he does uh, folk art. And uh, he's local to me out in Utah, and we've had some interesting discussions all through the pandemic, and they have a fairly large uh, blue chip cardboard operation. And for them, it was all of the above. Uh, it was the fact that they had a bunch of inventory, and as soon as the pandemic hit, that inventory just went to zero almost immediately, as every as, you know, massive run on puzzles. Uh, and then from there, okay, well, they needed to make more puzzles, and they ran into problems sourcing materials, and then they ran into problems uh, staffing the warehouse. It, it really was just like the, the perfect combination of everything. But I know that what they're still, what they are still having a problem with. Uh, last I talked to them was uh, the paper. The paper was the biggest thing that they were having a hard time getting. Uh, the labor shortages had kind of evened out from what I had heard from them. Uh, so not not a firsthand experience, but uh, hopefully insight into that. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm a grandmother and I started doing puzzles years ago when my daughter got me a wooden puzzle for Mother's Day. I'd never seen a wooden puzzle and she'd never seen one either. But that started me on wooden puzzles. And so over the years, I've, I've honed in on uh, artifact as one of my favorites because I think they're very innovative. And I've had a bit of a relationship with Maya over the years because I keep suggesting things to her. <laughs> so she's been listening to some of my suggestions about um, what types of puzzles I would like to see. But mainly, I wanted her to do children's puzzles as well as, you know, adult puzzles. And she said, well, that's not her, her customer base. Her customers are not interested in that. She only had one 
children's puzzle with larger pieces, and I loved it. But so she didn't do it anymore. I, and she then over the years she's done puzzles with it looked like they're for children, but they're difficult to do. It's just a, it's a subject matter. I've got my whole family doing puzzles now. I've got my grandchildren and, and the adults, and they all started doing puzzles. I mean, good thing that, um, one good thing that I find that Artifact has been doing is they've been making smaller puzzles. They always did have some smaller puzzles, but they've been making more and more of them lately. And puzzles that sell for 25, 30, 35, 50 dollars. Which make, I've started buying and putting them in cupboards. Well, I've been doing that for a while. And I give them away as gifts. And prior to, well, leave it even now, most people I run into, and I live in New England, you know, it's a busy place, no one has ever heard of wooden puzzles for adults. Oh, they can say, yes, I did wooden puzzles as a child. And they've never seen one. And so I, I show the pictures when I can. I let them borrow one, you know, but people don't know about them. And they're so much fun because they have interesting shapes. And so I've been buying a lot of puzzles like that. And I would like to see, I would like to see them in stores. Small puzzles that are affordable as a gateway into the more expensive puzzles that you buy. I don't know how many of you are, are, are familiar with the artifact puzzles, but those are the ones they're most familiar with. And they have really unusual cuts and surprises. And, and uh, that's fun for kids. Kids like, your kids like the puzzles. And my daughter has three boys, and they love the puzzles. They help with them. You know, the puzzles that are too hard for them. And uh, they help the whole family. Uh, one of the puzzles. Great, thank you. There's a, there's a general store in our town that, that's got new owners and they have a little bookshop and a pub and, and I talked them into getting some puzzles last year for the store. So they got some smaller ones and a couple of bigger ones and they all sold out within a, a couple of months and they didn't get any more except that one of them didn't sell. But we're going to get some more around the holidays to sell. But, um, Great. I'm thinking, why not get them now? Thank, thank, thank you very much for, for your insight on, on how children's puzzles are, are needed uh, and you'd like to see things more out in the stores, whatever. But um, I'm, I'm curious. Okay, we got some, we got some hands. Some people really want to say something. Okay. Rebecca? Quite a few that, that do that, that um, you take the part of the puzzle. 
and you can create other things. Stumpcraft has a few little ones in theirs, and I also really love that trend. That's like my, I think for me, the next step in puzzles, because I like a little, like I've solved the puzzle, and then there's an extra treat at the end, like if you can solve this hidden thing, extra kudos for you. I love that part. <laughs> But I don't know how easy that is with hand cut because I know most of the thing, puzzles that I've seen that have that are laser cut because it's easier to make and a computer do it. Yeah. I want to get back to children's puzzles. For a while, there were on the market puzzles that had, and I think they were mostly cardboard, that had um, <coughs> the wheel for the whole family. So there were a whole bunch of little pieces, and then there was a section that would have quite large pieces. And the idea was you sit down at the table, you push all the large pieces of the kid, and uh, and then they do their, you know, that part and so on. On, on Liberty, someone who had a really bad experience with them, um, Liberty's factory was actually shut down by the governor for, um, for three or four months at the beginning of the pandemic, so they could not do a thing. And then the orders <laughs> kept piling up. So by the time they were able to resume and, and to figure out um, uh, mitigation measures for their factory, which isn't so big. Um, by the time they got were able to start filling orders, they had you know a year's backlog of orders to fill. So um, so they had a, a particular problem. They, were, they really had rationed them for a long time. Um, so that's all I have to say. Question back there. Before you go further, could you please either pass the line or ask people to leave I I have an excellent hearing. I can barely hear the people when they're over there, especially if they got their backs to me. Yeah. Or repeat what they're saying. Hi, I just want to answer the question about the children in the zone. I can't. I'm, I'm carrying the zones. I also have a line for children, and I'm doing small and cut. Because of these large pieces for children, so they are usually for five by seven, like around 15 pieces. I cannot sell them in store because stores, I, I, I approach store next to my neighborhood in California, they ask me minimum of 50% of the sale. I cannot do that. And that's why I don't have my proposals in store. It's only online. Otherwise, I cannot. It's like giving them away if I go in stores. Um, I'd like to steer the, steer the discussion a little bit back towards the, the original intent, which was the evolution of puzzle and where do we think it's going and what what did you see here that was innovative to you? Was it the combination of different materials within the same puzzle, which I think was fascinating in a couple of examples. Um, where, where, where do you think this is going? Um, what's gonna be the next thing that's gonna pop up in the puzzle world? Or in the business model, are rentals and sharing of puzzles going to come back in a new way? Um, we saw it last night from Maya, we've heard from Spencer, the, the rental puzzle business is, is still there and maybe increasing um, through all of this. Is so, a question? I, I bet I have a long time. Yeah. I've been trying to get the attention for a while. I just wanted to add to the earlier point made about social media. Um, I don't use Facebook for philosophical reasons, but I use Twitter a lot. I've been using it for years and years. And, um, I'm, as a collector, really interested in documentation and really setting a historical record. And I feel that in the digital world, the historical record is rather fragile. Um, I've been using Flickr, which was set up in 2004 as a site for photographers to share with other photographers. And we kind of co-opted that in the puzzle community and set up groups, and made albums, and made galleries, and connected with people. And the BCD, which is an English-based group that I think is more uh, focused on, on documentation and collecting, um, uses that now. They kind of have used that since the pandemic started. Um, the point I wanted to make was that um, Flickr's future was very uncertain for a long time. They were owned by Yahoo, and then Yahoo kind of sold them to Smugmug, which is a competitive computing company. And we weren't really sure what was going on. And a lot of us have put a lot of time into uh, documenting and taking photos. And just this year, Flickr's set up the Flickr Foundation. And so they've re, uh, they, they really set up a, a Flickr Forever campaign. So they're, they're 
goal, I think, is a subscriber-based model that isn't at all like what Facebook does with monetization. And I think I would be surprised, or I wouldn't be surprised if Flickr lasted longer than Facebook in, in the decades to come. But I think it's really, there are hundreds of thousands of photos on Flickr of puzzles in there. So if you have any interest in um, adding to those, that would be really wonderful. Thank you very much. That's great. The historians of the <laughs> I like that. So you mentioned social media, and we basically have several social media gurus for puzzles here. Um, the younger crowd, not me. Yvonne does a lot of posting where she will record her stuff. And the Sarah, who ran our raffle last night, and Diane, who has been posting all of this stuff on our Puzzle, Par Puzzle Parley Facebook group. So I want to bring that to, specifically, you mentioned a party line. Well, social media, that's the party line now. So, um, I would like to add, like, the USA Jigsaw Puzzle Association hosts a monthly puzzle club, which is like a book club for puzzles. You can hang out, and it uses Gather, which is another new technology. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's fun if you get to hang out with other enthusiasts. There's like different rooms for different things. There's like a speed puzzle room. There's a virtual puzzle room so you can all work the same virtual puzzle on the, the you know, the, the ones on the computer where you drag and click and make them go. Or you can just sit and chat about puzzles. Um, so there's lots of new technology out there for, I guess, younger and older generations come together online from their own homes and not have to travel, you know, very far away. So that's where technology is taking, I think, the puzzle community. It's like, it's easier to connect across the country and the world, and you can make friends that you've never seen before, and then finally see them today, and this weekend, and be like, oh my god, and have tons of things to talk about already because you've already already connected by the internet. Um, the same with when we went to the World Championships in Spain, we already knew a few people that would be there because of the internet and having connected over Instagram <clears throat> and, and Facebook and such like that. So we, we, would, we met up with a few people in Barcelona and Madrid and had like already established connections out there because of the internet. So I think that is very much where the, the future of puzzle socializing is going. Um, this, this is great too. I love meeting people and hanging out and actually talking face to face to people too, but I think that is like one of the first steps before funnel, hit the funnel or whatever. And I, that's how I got introduced to like wooden puzzles and all that stuff is from online. Speaking of online stuff, now there are puzzle TV shows, aka you know YouTube, that is specifically um, talking only about puzzles. Karen Puzzles is a very well-known puzzler. That she's probably the most well-known for just on YouTube. Uh, Tammy has been interviewed on there. Uh, we also have Puzzle Crunch, which is a live video through Instagram, and they are literally just two people shooting the poop. You know what I mean? Like, they're just talking about whatever, and they have a bunch of people that will show up every Saturday around 11, I think it is, and just chat, puzzle. They share the new puzzles that they got, they share the new, um, you know, who got what in the, their little puzzle group, and it's, you know, it's a community, and it's all online, and we have virtual speed puzzling, which you can talk about that one. <laughs> yes, the, because of the pandemic, uh, speed puzzling went from in person to online, which made it easier for me to jump into that world because there was no speed puzzling in Los Angeles. <laughs> I would either have to drive very far or take a flight, which made it difficult. 
So that's how I got into, I didn't get into speed puzzling until COVID hit because then it forced everything online and it was easier for me to join because I just had to roll out of bed and walk two feet to the desk. <laughs> so, you know, like, it's just like you, they send you, you register, they send you all the same puzzle in the mail and then on the appropriate day you log into Zoom and you make sure your camera is facing the table so they can see the puzzle, usually a little higher is nice, so they can see the top of it, and then... Unopened puzzle? Yes, it's unopened, it's in a package and you can't see the image. And then and then he'll tell you, open the bag, and you open the bag and you get like, maybe at most three minutes to look at the image before he says go, and then you puzzle, and then, and then, yeah. It's mostly silent, though. Live puzzling is different because there's a lot of yelling. <laughs> I think the world is big, and you guys are listening to what's next in a lot of puzzling, but I think the world is big enough for everyone. <laughs> interested to see where the subscription and the rental model goes. Uh, the rental club that we're kind of relaunching, uh, kind of like Maya was saying last night, one puzzle can make one person happy, but you rent a puzzle and you can make ten people happy. I really like that, that concept. And I think that puzzling up until now has been a relatively localized experience. People are puzzling on their own, people are puzzling at home with family and friends. Uh, but I do think that the trend of puzzling with people online not necessarily, I mean, in addition to making connections and meeting people and sharing that interest, I think that finding a way to take the subscription and the rental model uh, and pair that with a social experience online in a similar way that you see uh, video gamers or people doing Dungeons and Dragons online, you know, that, that, that was something that went from a very localized uh, collective experience at home to now a broader experience. And I could definitely see that same thing happening with puzzles. And I'm not sure exactly how. I don't know if that is that Artifact comes up with a single design and they only do it once and then they ship it out to everybody at the same time and everyone is posting online at the same time about this really cool new puzzle. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what that collective social experience of puzzling will look like, but I do think that the you're definitely on track that, that that's where things are going, is uh, online. I have two questions for all of you manufacturers. Um, is anyone's business hurting since anyone? Handmakers uh, since COVID? It's, it's been up and down. <laughs> I think that as, as, uh, as COVID hit and as demand I think we are still trying to figure out what, what is the new normal as, as demand kind of peaked hugely right at the beginning of the stay-at-home orders and then as things started opening up, obviously demand dropped a little bit, but um, I wouldn't say it's difficult for us, but it is um, unsure. <laughs> I, we're, we're not quite sure what to expect for demand, specifically from the hand cut side. My second question. Um, what, uh, I looked on Amazon this morning for wooden puzzles, and there were thousands and thousands of them. Is, does that hurt your businesses? None of them were artifact or any names I recognize. Could you repeat what you just said? Could you repeat? Amazon. I looked on Amazon this morning for wooden puzzles. Pages, pages, tons. Um, I, does that hurt your business? I recognize one name, many pages in a galaxy, and I think, um, but very, very. There are a lot of knockoff puzzles on Amazon right now. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to diss any particular country, but there are certain companies, and then there's knockoffs of the knockoffs. Um, so, what I would say to the knockoffs is that a lot of people like that heard about wood puzzles but don't have the money to yeah. get the, uh, they'll buy the cheap ones and they'll be like, this is great. And they'll get it and they'll probably get it put off of wood puzzles because it's so bad. Yes. <laughs> I get, I get, because people know that I love puzzles, they gift me these and I'm like, oh, this is terrible, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I will totally do it. 
once and then give it away. But um, also, I wanted to talk about the, the thing that you talked about with people doing puzzles all together. On Instagram, there's these things called puzzle, puzzle alarms, which they will, somebody ahead of time will be like, I am going to do a puzzle, a specific puzzle, or it can be a puzzle theme. So like it could be Disney puzzles, fantasy puzzles, whatever, and they'll post the dates that they're doing it, like for a week or something like that. And then so a whole bunch of people on Instagram will get together and talk, do these puzzle, specific puzzles or puzzle. Like for June there was Pride Month, they did a whole month of Pride puzzles, like mm -hmm. rainbow Pride puzzles and stuff like that. It's puzzle Pride along. And basically everyone got together and like flooded Instagram with a whole bunch of like Pride puzzles and stuff like that, and then like I know there was a fantasy puzzle along, and people like doing you know dragons and all those kind of puzzles. So like that's to speak to community that way. What you were saying, it's kind of already happening. <laughs> oh, not just yeah, not just video. Just it, it's not. It's just photos on Instagram. It's not like you get together online and puzzle together. You puzzle by yourself and then post about it together. <laughs> Thank you everybody up here for your insights and for all of you out, uh, out uh, listening to us. Um, one last question before we start. Oh. Bring it into your community and yeah, do things in a whatever's appropriate for your community. Melinda? Yes, I just wanted to say that there is a person in our community, and she was hoping to be here but, but couldn't make it. She started a, basically a rental thing, but um, there's a historical inn, and she had Puzzle and Night where everybody came and there was, there was wine. And, uh, it was paper puzzles. Um, <laughs> But it was, it was very enjoyable. It was one of the, like, like one of those uh, faint evenings uh, type thing. She also uh, had groups. I know she had a group in our town's library where everybody met at a particular time in the morning, uh, one day a week, and puzzled. So there are quite a few things. Um, and I can also post her name, but she could probably give you some ideas about what's working and what hasn't worked, because she seemed to accomplish a great deal in a short time. So would the cutters like to figure out where to support that industry somehow, the way they support the hands-on heroes? I think uh, I, th I think our time is just about. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I um, in terms of community, um, I do know that on Facebook there's lots of puzzle swaps groups, and then my um, pers my city that I'm from has a fairly large one, 200 people, and they like post like every day about puzzles. I do think that in-person meeting has been put off because of COVID and but there has been interest in like hosting in-person swaps in like parking lots. We've done that and we meet people and talk about puzzles and stuff like that but puzzling together I think still is very covid -y not happening. <laughs> um, but there has been uh, interest in when this pandemic is an endemic, we would get together and host puzzle parties. Yeah. So you can probably look to 
if you go online and search for your local puzzle swap, you can probably organize a fair large, fairly large group of people to come and do puzzle swaps. I personally have, because I love wooden puzzles so much and I have a lot of them, I made a lending library in my garage, in my, my driveway for my town swap group and surrounding towns. And I'm, there's a lock book in there and I just wanted to run it itself because my job is fairly um, inten intensive. <laughs> I don't know, I don't, I'm not home a lot when I'm actually working. And so like, I was just like, this is gonna be the honor system guys and just log out the, the puzzle, treat it like you would, like if you owned it and then like bring it back and log it back in. And so far there's been no issues and everyone loves it. And so that's what I've done so far. All right, I'd like to, to, to bring this session to a close by House Carmen. She specifically asked on Facebook groups, are there any makers of puzzles that have maybe, you know, broken ones that they wouldn't really sell that they would like to donate? So I was like, yeah, <laughs> you can have all of these ones. So she's got a whole bunch of my puzzles that were like, test cuts on wood that I would not sell on, but it's great to test on. And um, so other makers, contact either your you know local library, you can get rid of puzzles that you would normally just throw away, especially with laser cuts, or if there's broken pieces, like, eh, like, there's a place that people will want to put them together. There's still that experience, even if it's not fantastic. I think we have to end. I've actually done that. I've repurposed uh, some, I don't want to call them waste puzzles, but less than perfect puzzles. I, I used to work very closely with Nervous, so they gave me a couple of those puzzles. I broke them into small kits and I gave them out to schools, libraries, you know, I, I repurposed them. And, uh, Fantastic. Yeah, there's definitely a, you know, That's great. That's great. So, show of hands. How many people have learned something here at this puzzle parlay? We have accomplished our mission.